If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. So depending on what part of the world you live in, 4x4 either makes you think of Jeep or of Land Rover. And uh, since we're here in uh, the United States of America, it's Jeep. However, there are still some people who were born and grew up here in the United States, and their first thought is Land Rover. And I'm riding with one of those people right now, my colleague, Mr. Sean O'Donnell, here at the Audrain. And uh, Sean, uh, just tell us a little bit about why you were drawn to Land Rovers. Sure, yeah, and you know, for me, Land Rover is my brand. I think I've uh, annoyed you to death with my Land Rover obsession at this point in time. But So my first car was a 1995 Land Rover Defender 90, um, which was a limited production car in the United States. They made them in 1994, 1995, and 1997. Now, the reason why I was so hooked on Land Rover was because my best friend, Roger, actually had a 1995 Land Rover Discovery in a five-speed manual transmission that his dad actually had to order from the factory, and it took about a year to get because of that unique configuration of the manual transmission. Let me interrupt uh, you just for a second, Sean. Just ask a question, because I know that among some hardcore Land Rover enthusiasts, the Disco was sort of not really considered a Land Rover. That's true, but he, his father also had to have a family car. Ah. And I think, you know, the Discovery was kind of that compromise as opposed to the, the Defender. It had leather seats, you know, it had, it was a fully loaded Discovery. It just happened to have a five-speed manual transmission. And in fact, Roger, who, you know, that was his first car. That was his car he drove in high school. And that was the car I learned to drive a manual transmission on, was that 1995 Land Rover Discovery. And everyone, of course, always knows the best car to learn to drive a stick on is somebody else's. Exactly, yes. So from that moment of learning to drive a manual transmission uh, in his Land Rover, my obsession began. You know, we started to watch the Camel Trophy videos, you know, where these explorers would take... Uh, Land Rover Defenders and Land Rover Discoveries across continents, similar to what we're doing right now, right, on this road. And, um, ah, ah. you know, they would they would go through these unforgiving terrains. The cars would go completely submerged. And more often than not, they would end the, 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 the rally, if you will, across that country. And the drivers would find themselves so in love with the vehicle, a lot of them ended up actually purchasing it the Camel Trophy Land Rovers because of the connection they have and the battle they went through together. Um, they, had, they had bonded in such a way that they couldn't it, exactly. relieve themselves of, of their lucky horses. And the funny thing is, you know, we, we ended up selling the Defender 90 and about six months after that, my, my dad and I, we missed it so much, we ended up buying a Defender 110, a 1993 uh, North American spec uh, Defender 110 just because of that connection we had and there's something that Land Rover does to me, classic Land Rovers, and every time I step in one, like the one we're in today, even though this one's been modified, I still feel like I'm at home. And I think we, we all kind of have that connection with our first car. Um, even though this, you know, is a completely different uh, style and a, a different uh, type of car, it still has that similar of you know what you're in. You're in a Land Rover, you're in a purpose-built vehicle, and that's what I love about them so much is that purpose. And, uh, you know, for me, again, it's all about being home. Well, let's talk about that purpose-built. I mean, of course, uh, Land Rover uh, was the first 4x4, small 4x4, uh, multi-purpose English car built. Yes. Um, you can get into great uh, discussions <laughs> Oh, with yes. uh, Land Rover enthusiasts about uh, the influences of the uh, the Jeep on the first Land Rover, and doubtless the Jeep was certainly a seminal influence in what the Land Rover was. Um, introduced in 1948, and interestingly enough, um, of course, all the early Land Rovers were had all aluminum bodies, and uh, the purpose was not necessarily lightness; it was the fact that 
aluminum was not rationed after the war the way steel was in the UK. And so it was a practical uh, way to build them as well. And um, although some people think, well, it's because of, of durability and, and anti-rust features, but the fact they had uh, steel uh, frames and platforms and aluminum bodies meant that you still had a lot of electrolytic uh, corrosion potentially going on there. So it exactly. wasn't about durability. Yeah. Um, but it is quite interesting that, as you mentioned, the example that we're driving now, which is a uh, Series 2 car from 1960, sorry, this is Series 2A from 1970 that we're driving now. Um, this is very interesting. If you remember the, the wonderful Disney Pixar movie Cars, uh, one of my favorite scenes in it is the uh, drill sergeant yes. uh, who, who leads the fancy SUVs into <laughs> off-road boot camp. And uh, that's the feeling I'm getting here right now because this car has, as our British friends would say, been tarted up to within an inch of its life. It's wearing this uh, incredible, almost candy apple red metallic paint job. It's got everything on it powder coated to within an inch of its life. It's probably as un Land Rover a Land Rover as <laughs> could possibly be imagined. But uh, I know that you youngsters sort of like this kind yeah. of thing, don't you? Well, I yeah, I do. And uh, I do like the way this has been modified. I think it's done well. It, you know, I, I appreciate the originality of Land Rovers. And I also appreciate when there's an example like this. But, you know, mentioning the paint, um, you know, I love the fact that, you know, the first Land Rover, the, you know, they, they were all painted green because of the excess paint from the war. Um, you know, so I, I, I also love that aspect as well. So, um, but to me, there's nothing like a Land Rover. I, I, and I will argue it, and I will, it, it'll always be my car, and, uh, you know, it'll always be my brand. Well, let me ask you this too, as a Land Rover enthusiast, um, there's obviously the, the romantic aspect of the fact of it having been your first car, mm -hmm. um, watching the, uh, the Camel GT off-road uh, events. Now, do you enjoy driving off-road as well? So, funny story there, when we bought, I do, so, and when we, when we purchased the, the Land Rover Defender 90, I was 16 at the time, so I actually didn't have my driver's license yet. In New Jersey, 17 was when you got your driver's license. Um, but what I did was there was an off-road park in Pennsylvania and uh, I actually dragged my dad who had, could care less about cars, could care less about uh, off-roading but really enjoyed my passion and was always and always has been uh, a big influence in pursuing my passions. And we actually went to an off-road park in Pennsylvania. He drove, which was very interesting. and. Uh, we actually had a blast, and to this day, we bond over it. We talk about it. Um, you know, we scaled. We really put the the, the Defender to it, through its paces. We scaled, you know, very uh, steep grades. Went down steep grades. Waded through water, and it was just an absolute blast. And it was something new that he and I have never done before. And we really got to see the capability of what the Land Rover did. And a lot of people tow their vehicle. We drove three hours there, off roaded and then drove it home three hours. We well, got to get a lot of fuel, <laughs> but well, we, we were able to do that. It's much like the, uh, the entire idea of racers who drive to the track, drive their cars on the track, and then drive them home. Yes. It also, frankly, sharpens your wits about what it is that you're doing during the event, because you know you've got to drive this back home. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it keeps you focused. Yeah, no, we had a great time. It's also an interesting thing that, that um, Land Rover does still obviously do, just as manufacturers like BMW and Porsche have their high performance driving schools. Land Rover does a lot of off-road driving events, um, I think both to uh, introduce people to the type of uh, enjoyment that can be had from off-road yeah. driving and also of course to help the sales of their cars and uh, to help their owners to enjoy them in the way that they were intended to be used, which is another uh, point. Uh, that, you know, I think there's got to be a great thrill for people who really enjoy uh, off-roading uh, no matter what brand of vehicle they have. Take their brand new vehicle out uh, in an off-road uh, event and get that first scratch. Yes. You know, that first rock chip. It's like, yes. you know, it's, 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 it's a badge of honor. That's very true. And, you know, Land Rover did just reintroduce the Defender to the North American market as well as the European market, or across the world, rather. 
Um, you know, the last time the Defender was in North America was 1997. So, you know, I, a lot of people like myself who are Defender series enthusiasts were excited about it, and I think they did a brilliant job with the modern restrictions with safety and emissions and, and such. I think they did a brilliant job with the new Defender, so I'm excited to see what Land Rover will do as far as further expeditions, etc. By the way, I'm having a little bit of fun here, just doing a little bit of sliding around this nice loose surface here, and since it's not my car. Um, but the um, that's another thing which is uh, quite interesting as well, is the fact that there's so much enjoyment to be had in driving at low speeds yes. that a lot of people don't get. You know, um, just being able to drive a vehicle where you can feel what it's doing when 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 the when the traction begins to give away and you know exactly what's going to happen. Absolutely. You know, to me that that's far more fun than taking a 1,200 horsepower car and driving at a 50 miles per hour on on a smooth road. I mean, you know, it's it's that that's not real driving enjoyment for me, but. It's very interesting, um, so many of these cars, so much of the Land Rover culture, especially with the vintage cars, has been about modification because the cars have been designed to be driven. Mm -hmm. And um, so you frequently will find engines that have been replaced with newer engines, sometimes with totally different kinds of engines. Absolutely. Uh, especially with the, uh, the diesel uh, examples, and we'll mm -hmm. be driving a diesel example uh, in a little bit. Um, but it's something that ultimately has made the very earliest cars quite collectible because so few of them have survived in a totally unmodified form. They were used hard, worked very, very hard, and frankly, you know, not thought of as something that anybody would think of as a collector vehicle. I completely agree. Again, going back to that purpose built, and they were used very heavily. One of the reasons why I loved my uh, Defender was Especially in the winter time, you know, you go in a parking lot and there's always that one parking spot that is the best, but it's full of snow that the plow, and I was that person who always parked on it. And I always got the best spot and I had the vehicle for it, so that was what I would do. Practical application it's, of capability. Since you learned to uh, drive a, a stick shift on the Land Rover, I think it's also worth pointing out that um, in my generation, the, the vehicle of choice to learn to drive a stick was the VW Beetle, because much like this Land Rover, it has one of, one of the vaguest, longest throw uh, <laughs> manual transmissions you can ever imagine. And so if you could master a box like this, then you can drive absolutely anything. So I think that it was, uh, you, you were very well, uh, very well selected there. And it's funny, for a long period of time, that was the only manual transmission car I drove was my friend's Land Rover Discovery. And I vividly remember the first manual transmission I drove after that. I was like, this can't be, this <laughs> is, is, you know, you, you go from driving that to, you know, to popping gears in and out. And so it is funny you mentioned that. When, when you drive along on a smooth tarmac road in this particular example, you know, I'm reminded that you want, or at least I want, one of these to feel like it's the kind of vehicle it was designed to be. Um, to see it in this really shiny paint with absolutely perfect trim and all of that just makes me think of, of somehow a, a sumo wrestler dressed up for a gala party. It just doesn't make any sense. Are these amphibious as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, with a snorkel. <laughs> which my Defender 90 did have, you could wade up to about six feet of water. So, Sean, even though I know that you are fully a landy nut. Yes. And you do appreciate modified vehicles. Yes. I have a feeling that the next time we're out driving together in a Land Rover of a very different character, I think you're going to like it a little bit more than this one, but we'll see. I'm excited regardless. All right, onward and upward.